Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very exciting and very energizing conversation that we'll be exploring the CGIAR digital strategy. We've got a panelist full of experts in the digital agriculture sphere, as well as Brian King from the platform, who are gonna be talking about some emerging trends in digital agriculture, exploring what comes next and, and where do we go from here after two and a half days of the convention, um, and talking about kind of what we can expect in this landscape. So first I'm gonna hand it off to Michiko Katagami to introduce herself. Hi, my name is Michiko Katagami. I work for Asian Development Bank and I'm the focal for this food security and rural development uh, sector coordinate within ADB. Nice to, nice to be here. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm very happy to be here and to join this exciting panel today. My name is Saram Bagobunu and I'm the Regional Director for East and Southern Africa for the International Fund for Agricultural Development. So really excited and looking forward to the discussion. Uh, hi everyone, uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for the invitation. It's, it's nice to be back with you uh, today. My name is uh, Ana Castillo and I work at the IDB Lab, the Innovation Lab for the IDB Group, the Inter-American Development Bank, um, particularly I'm part of the ACTEC team there. So it's a pleasure to be here with, uh, and also love to be sharing this panel with other uh, ladies. So thank you very much for the invitation. Hi everybody, I'm, I'm Brian King. I serve as the coordinator of the CGIR platform for Big Data and Agriculture. We're a, a cross-cutting program of the global CGIAR Agricultural Development uh, Research Consortium. Hello everybody, really happy to have a chance to speak with you about digital strategy in the agricultural research for development space and really happy to have uh, such wonderful regional discussions to engage with us on the ideas um, around digital in this in this sector. So uh, the CGIAR over the last several months and, and the platform for big data has been engaged in some pretty wide ranging strategic analysis. We've been looking at, um, you know, kind of internal organizational capabilities, and we've also been looking external in a kind of wide swath of the agricultural research for development um, ecosystem. And this is this investigation and analysis has been guided by three big questions. What trends have the potential to transform agriculture in the next 10 years? What should an organization be able to do? to navigate or leverage those trends effectively? And what roles should public interest actors like CGIAR play in digital agriculture? And so through these various you know, types of investigation, we found four broad areas, sort of broad trends and key intervention areas that it's, it really appears are making sense for public interest actors. Uh, to engage. And so I'll spin through them briefly here. So um, related to data, uh, the data standards, open data, you know, they're advancing uh, sort of inexorably in the scientific space in terms of, you know, just access to data, access to the public good assets that are generated from, from public good research. At the same time, we're seeing that there's increased demand for data and even increased demand for being able to manage restricted data that can be restricted for very good reasons. So intellectual property or privacy or policy and regulatory reasons. And so increasingly what we're seeing is that public interest actors can play a role in sort of mediating the responsible exchange of data, even where data may be restricted for really legitimate reasons. Um, this is important uh, in its own right, and also important because artificial intelligence and machine learning applications are extremely data hungry. And it's really important that you have good quality validated data if you're going to be using these uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, tools. Which brings us to our next uh, trend. So, you know, I'm usually among the first to, to, to point out how kind of breathless and you know, irrationally exuberant we can be about um, emerging digital technologies. And, and absolutely artificial intelligence gets that kind of treatment in the business press and kind of everywhere else. Um, but, you know, through our, our interviews and through the literature review, um, there's really, you know, it really looks like 
artificial intelligence could well be poised to be um, unique. It really could well be poised to be the next general purpose technology, you know, as transformational as combustion engines or electricity or what have you. And part of the reason of that is that it sort of, you know, flows from or, or you know, is enabled by, and to some degree, even maybe we could think about subsumes all of the preceding uh, data and information technologies. And so as we see rapidly global, you know, rapid global digitization of economy and society, uh, artificial intelligence provides us these tools to kind of sort of, you know, to begin to kind of reason over uh, all of those. And so we absolutely as a, you know, agricultural research for development um, uh, sector need to be claiming uh, the, the potential of these tools. And we also need to be guiding how they're used responsibly and ethically in the myriad contexts where we work around the world. I mentioned rapidly digitizing economies and societies. Um, and this is really important in terms of certainly CGIR engagement in terms of new ways of engaging with that changing digital reality. Uh, so, you know, we come from a legacy, CGIR does, in terms of, uh, come from a legacy of, um, you know, agricultural extension, agronomic research, um, research into adoption and diffusion of, of innovations. And so I think it's really important, certainly for CGIR, to be engaging with these digital services, bundling not only the, the sort of legacy that we bring, to digital services, but also looking at new kinds of services that we can sort of enable or participate in. So, um, you know, mobile financial services, uh, new types of analytic services that can enable others to go and develop new products and services and so forth. And so I think that, um, you know, the, the, uh, the cost effectiveness, the ability to reach um, many small producers, many small businesses working in value chains at scale cost effectively is this vast new opportunity. And uh, certainly CGIR as a public interest organization seeking to further uh, agricultural development, we need to be taking as much advantage as we can of those new kind of massive communications channels and, and ways of building new interactivity. Um, and then lastly, Sector intelligence is some, where we sort of landed on what we're calling here. And it's this recognition that, you know, some of our most pressing challenges, uh, uh, you know, humanity's most pressing challenges are problems of collective action. You know, we need to be organizing public, private, nonprofit actors around common interests where we align. And at the same time, there's a real problem worldwide with trust in institutions, trust in data. And so, and this is, this is to governments, it's to research organizations like ourselves, private sector and so forth. And so I, I think that public interest actors really need to, you know, sort of do their best. You know, they need to be creating the good quality validated data, but then they need to be doing it with a frame of how do we um, guide and enable and measure progress of collective action that can help us to address some of our pressing challenges. So from a, a agriculture research for development perspective, I see this could intersect very nicely with, you know, the, the typical research cycle. And so at the stage of designing research, um, you know, in, in, you know, in countries or regions or what have you, we need to take some time to take stock of what existing data and information and stakeholders and sort of problem definitions, um, uh, agriculture development um, sector strategies and so forth. And we start taking stock of, you know, defining the problems and defining the associated data and the sharing um, dimensions of that data so that we are um, equipped then to be able to dial in and make sure that we're making the most relevant and appropriate analyses. We can also use these to inform and develop and support development of new uh, products and services through digital communications channels. And of course, you know, the goal is then to try to um, advance sector development strategies and measure progress along the way and see how do we, you know, kind of continually crowd in public, private, nonprofit actors around achieving those strategies. Internally, I'll just say briefly at CGIR, there's a, a pretty mature framework that comes from some research. I believe they had 
uh, data from 15,000 organizations. Um, and it was done jointly by World Economic Forum and Accenture. And what they do is, is um, structure, you know, they've identified five broad enablers that are important for digital organizations to kind of get right. And so leadership, um, data access and management, the digital ecosystem, how are you partnering, engaging with an ecosystem wider than yourself? What are the skills you should be cultivating within or hiring for within your organization? And then the supporting infrastructure. And so internally at CGIR, we have a series of, of recommendations and action items that, that sort of map to these five um, broad enablers. And then just lastly, in closing, you know, the, where I think the, the vision needs to, to align from certainly this, you know, digital strategy work that we're, we're seeing from our own organization in that engagement and intervention on those broad trends that really, we really do think will be shaping the future of agriculture over the coming 10 years and perhaps more um, is a key is a key thing for us to be doing. Also strengthening ourselves as an organization and building our own capacity to be able to engage on those things. Really what we would like to do is have this in service of a kind of broader mission-driven innovation uh, or mission-driven digital innovation uh, 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 approach where we're continually building our own capacity and sourcing and fostering interventions that can help contribute to to realizing the sustainable development goals. So I will stop there and um, we will continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. That was a really stimulating sort of like inspiring presentation. I would like to congratulate the, um, oh, by the way, my name is Michiko Katagami. I'm from Asian Development Bank. I work on the, the series of food security investment and also the rural development investment together with the multiple teams within the bank. And also we engage in the, um, the research project. And what we increasingly I'm mindfully just trying to apply is the one key thing is the digitization. And we've been talking about this right from the, 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 the top of the management and board and also down to our clients, the government, private sectors, our investees and group of farmers and so forth. So everybody's sort of tried to feel the potential of the doing something extraordinary with this at the technology adaptions yet we still don't have the sort of as a institution strategy how are we going to utilize this so we really and my your sort of guts and it's a great job and it's a huge task for the cg centers to come up with a digital strategy first of all and i i, I would like to congratulate you guys for, for this a great effort um i just wanted to mention about this that first uh, what we actually do because not many people understand what adb does one thing is about this lending to this private public sector lending to the developing countries our member countries and also we invest in the, the private companies in the food companies or the banks who support the agribusiness. And also we have a relatively new commerce, which is called ADB Venture, which is actually directly take the equity uh, in the startup of the digital architect and also fintech companies mainly to support the development of this food ecosystem. And then that's something that we would like, that we've been approaching the food security as, uh, and also the rural development agenda. And then every, sort of aspect of this uh, operation investment at the appraisal um, implementations and monitoring evaluation we've been trying to make use of some of this uh, digital technology big data analysis and our research team is going a little bit more ahead of us all of us which is try to apply the big data and untraditional source of data combine that together traditional survey data and then the, our statistical uh, statistics department has been working on this for the past three years and they just uh, published the, their outcome last week and then the, it's really interesting that we could do uh, with the new kind of transformational type of the, the business uh, processes, but we do not have a strategic vision as an institution yet. So, wow. So, CG Center is going ahead, way well ahead of us. So, that's great to see. Um, some of the, the, the cautious things that is internal discussion is that we keep appearing is about this uh, by the applying for the, some new technology, don't we have a risk of the widening that 
the, the inequality, digital divide argument. So we don't know how that's gonna go out. Uh, we don't have a good rich experience in, in say it's pros and cons about that yet, but it's a right now for so selection of technology, application of digital technology, uh, big data analysis, we always try to pick something that would definitely benefit the smallholder farmers. We have the, uh, in Asia, we have about 400 million farmers and what our primary goals of the investment is to integrate them into the marketing system and make them more productive to make, uh, to make them become a, more of uh, the business people rather than the, just the farmers who's just going, you know, the live, live on by. And then uh, we have a big hope about this, uh, that transformational sort of framework of this, that transform the, the food system, how it works by applying the cost effective, uh, the digital technology, that's our sort of aspiration. Just to react to some of the points Brian raised, one thing about data, um, we're struggling with this one for the past three years, straight on, sharing um, collected data, utilizing um, conventional data. How can we manage this one and share with others? As a public institution, we always want to share all this, that the, whatever we purchase or create it, want to uh, share with the, for the public use, for the other people's use, but as a, we're not being able, we haven't been able to do that very well. And then emerging in issue is about the privacy we are our application for example um crop yield estimations at the household level they would just understand about the crop crop yield gap and then to think about how to target and how to understand how to the, the short the close that the crop gap um agenda or the uh credit scoring basically just the Profiling that, that each farmer is what they're capable of doing and also what they've been doing, what their business potentials are, all this set uh, the things that can be done technically to get them onto the in the world of this, uh, that get them visible for the financiers to look at for their investment. Those are all sort of uh, directly relevant to the privacy sort of, of the, each of those participants at uh, the beneficiary farmers. And we don't know, Quite frankly, we don't know how to deal with this. Deal with this, the privacy, and uh, with the clever, all this machine learning techniques, a lot of experts just tell me that it doesn't really, <laughs> there's no solution to these things. And so I really want to have this, some of this uh, uh, institution who's been and spearheading this efforts that I understand that in fact, uh, CG Center being uh, the trustworthy so domain knowledge cluster, I mean, is the best person, but the institution, third party, I think that kind of institution can come into being the data management in a responsible manner. And that's, that might be very, very useful for this set, uh, solving some of the problem that I mentioned. With regard to the AI, um, we are first encountered application of AI for this uh, agricultural assistant at the ministry uh, assistance was, stark sort of as inspiring experience. So we started with this sort of excitement. So we still keep on trying, applying for this investment you know, as well as the research projects. One thing was about the, uh, the, the stark experience that we have uh, is that the way the Microsoft and doing, dealing with the rain fed farmers and then with the, all this knowledge, uh, the, the machine learning and based on all this digital data sets, they were able to change the peanut farmers who doesn't change anything but the sowing data of the peanuts and then increase their yield by 30%. And then we were, and we were sort of like a felt de devastated at the same time, wow, the machine learning can do this. And what have we been doing in the past 20 years or 30 years and so forth. So we are aspired to do uh, the testing of this AI applications, but we are not really getting there yet in terms of what sort of like uh, things that we want to do this in an in upscaling stage. And we, we don't know that much about all this, uh, the pros and cons about the utilizing machine learning. Digital services, this is very interesting area. Most of the time we work with the private companies and the research uh, institutions like universities and actual individual belongs to CG Center, not really the institution per se yet. Um, so we don't have the systemic, systemic sort of uh, institutional partnerships to do this. But what is really important for us is to um, 
getting the, the useful technology-based um, services to in the hands of the smallholders. By so doing, we can create the market space for those private sector players who provide essential services to thrive on beyond the scope of our intervention. That's the primary importance. And um, this is something that we cannot really, um, that, that's the very reason why we don't have the much of this research project per se. It's a little bit more like investment project oriented, the drive is in there. Um, lastly, important thing about the, the application technology, we always focus the user, um, user interface development uh, to make sure that is that the simple message can change the life of the farmers. That's not really that easy, even if the technology is a top notch and is great and proven to be very effective. For example, simple messaging technologies, that's very useful and handy rather than this app de development and also the smartphones uh, based sort of interventions. Uh, we, we, so we're still doing the combination of face-to-face. -face. We don't really give up on the face-to-face -face, uh, right now. Uh, fortunately, some of the Asian countries still can do the face-to-face -face intervention for the extension services and so forth. So we just combine that mix of this digital services and uh, the face-to-face uh, -face based inter interactions. So lastly, our things is that after we just go around all this, uh, the trial areas of the applying for the digital technology, what we aspire to do, and you know, what many of our member countries are willing to do is to invest more in the digital technology infrastructure. Um, some countries declare that it's, it's a human right to access to certain data volume uh, internet access. And without which, we cannot really go the all the totality of this the farm, uh, farmers communities. We have so many of them and they're very fragmented. So um, that, it's something that, that, that we've been starting discussing about and together with the traditional institutional development and policy sort of intervention. So I stop right here. Thank you very much. So good afternoon again, uh, colleagues. My name is uh, Saran Bagabunu and I'm the regional director for IFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development for East and Southern Africa. And it's very exciting um, for IFAD to participate uh, in this big data agriculture convention for 2020. Um, uh, we have recently at the fund developed an ict for d strategy. Um, it's a framework, 2016 to 2025. Uh, it's really focused on inclusive rural transformation. Um, we are coming in not really at the forefront of this game and we are aware that we're semi uh, playing catch up. But in our, let's say, wider theory of change, we really see that ICT has great potential for really leveraging and scaling up impact. Um, and so we really see, see ICT for the really digital solutions as part of our climate adaptation response, also as part of our response to um, enhancing communities' uh, participation in markets. So it's really around market information, how you manage that, how you leverage that, how you put that into the hands of smallholder farmers, and also in the delivery of essential um, transformative services like uh, financial services and nutrition services, So, but in a digital form. So the framework is really meant to try and scale up our development impact as we strive to go for uh, the SDGs. Uh, we know that um, agricultural productivity remains a big challenge uh, right across Africa, but also very specifically in East and Southern Africa. And we want to see how we can use the digital solutions to boost resilience. Really in the face of uh, the multiple impacts of COVID-19, the disruption we have seen in food systems, the fact that we do need to shorten uh, supply chains, we need to increase productivity in the face of uh, a doubling and tripling uh, of populations, and in a context of shutdown, this becomes imperative. So uh, our framework really looks at trying to scale up the uptake of digital solutions and digital technologies. We're also seeking as International Fund for Agriculture Development to partner uh, with ICT for D providers in the different spheres. So not only in data management, as uh, Brian mentioned, uh, but also in the delivery uh, of services. So different types of smart partnerships we're also trying to leverage ict for d for knowledge management um, and analytics. 
and uh, as well we are in, in as as leaders uh, in the whole sphere of sustainable development finance we're also trying to raise awareness and build capacities uh, of using and utilizing uh, digital solutions uh, for change. So, so that is just my uh, brief introduction around how IFAD has, has, has uh, embraced um, information technology and digital services. And if we deep dive more into um, what we are doing, uh, particularly from an Eastern Southern Africa perspective, as IFAD, we, 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 our model is an assembler of development finance. So we actually are very keen on even mobilizing beneficiary contributions because we really do believe domestic resources in the end build up sustainability. And we know that digital solutions are very good way and efficient way of mobilizing community participation in our rural transformation projects. We also, uh, of course, come in with EFAC financing. We have government financing, financing from the private sector and from international co-finance. So, in essence, we really do build up partnerships with other finances around the globe, including the African Development Bank and the World Bank um, in, in all of our operations. To date, uh, IFAD has a portfolio of roughly 55 ongoing programs and 4.8 billion in value of 2.2 billion, which is IFAD financing. Um, and uh, we across uh, the region have had a portfolio that is slightly shifting, really looking at the trends that are, uh, that are emerging uh, to adapt and introduce uh, um, changes and transformation in the food system. Uh, so we have had uh, basically a whole host of programs that support access to financial services through lines of credit with local development banks. That's a big cohort of our portfolio. We have now expanded and extended more to the blue portfolio, which is really aquaculture, captive fisheries, and really looking at eco and ocean-wide blue economy type investments. We also have quite a lot of investments in uh, traditional livestock, a lot of climate um, smart investments, looking at how we can make use of water more efficiently. It's a big and growing concern is land is degradating right across the, the sub-region. Uh, and, and, and as a we have been shifting our, our focus and embracing things like landscape approaches into our program so that we can actually look across landscapes to see what type of productive systems, what type, how can we incentivize smallholder farmers to provide essential ecosystem services in our designs of our investments, we, we, we see that that is an opportunity for real transformation. How can we get the data we need on the soil types uh, the water tables, uh, the rain levels, uh, you know, weather patterns, and use that information to design accordingly to that landscape, to that foodscape. And we see an increasing demand by uh, borrower countries in our sovereign operations around that. Uh, same uh, as Michiko, we also have uh, adaptively started and embraced a private sector strategy within IFAD. And the private sector strategy is really looking to partner and crowd in private equity debt, different types of instruments and tools to maximize um, the development returns through the private sector. And, and, and so there we are, uh, it's, it's really very fresh and new for us, but we are looking at working directly on productive alliances with the private sector to unlock value with smallholder farmers, really supporting the private sector to have enough services, uh, enough digital information that would allow them to meet the economic and, 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 the, and the environmental safeguards, standards for partnership with smallholder farmers. Uh, in addition, we have been evolving and upgrading, innovating our financial inclusion uh, portfolio to really look at weather indexing, insurance, uh, providing uh, farmers with the ability to take in insurance products up so that they can build their resilience in partnership with uh, World Food Program, for instance, in Zambia. So we're increasingly seeing uh, an entry and a crowding in uh, of, of digital. We are part of the wider Big Data 2030 initiative of Bill Melinda Gates. I think CJR is very much a part of that. If I wants to unlock and have a better understanding of the realities of households. So we're participating in that scheme across uh, all the countries uh, that are in there. 
and uh, we're very excited to be part of that because we, we see that at the end of the initiative we'll have uh, granular data that we've never had before and which will help and inform and improve the way that we, uh, we, we design uh, going uh, ahead uh, in the future. Then I think there's um, two, th two additional points I want to mention. We have made commitments under IFAD 11, which uh, ends in 2021, started in 2019, to improve nutrition outcomes, which is a huge problem in East and Southern Africa. Half of the communities in Southern Africa are struggling with obesity. The other half are stunted and mal and undernourished. And uh, we are really embracing uh, different analytical tools, whether it's fill the nutrition gap where we can get existing and comprehensive nutrition profiles of different members of households to inform how we need uh, to change dietary systems to meet their requirements. So, we are really moving ahead with this, uh, yet cognizant that you know the, the, the subregion is urbanizing very rapidly. That means there's huge transitions in how uh, smallholder farmers are able to access markets. What is the biggest and the big question that I'd like to put to this table in this important forum is how uh, we will be able to transform our urban markets in order to respond. Uh, to this transition and dynamic. Right now, markets are completely underdeveloped. Uh, cities are congested. We're not unlocking the best in the most sustainable way. So that will be something I look forward to discussing more as we move ahead uh, in, in today's, uh, day, today's deliberations. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, for the opportunity. Uh, as the IDB lab, I mean, our role is really promoting active ecosystems in the region. Um, we hardly believe that technology is really an enable of innovation in agriculture. Uh, one of our main concerns is inclusion. So we are really looking forward uh, for more than 16.6 million families in the region that represent 80% of the farmers that are really small, very small farmers. Uh, you know, Latin America is, uh, and the Caribbean is particularly different because we, we have small and very big farmers just uh, living in, in, in less than a three kilometer area. But we, we, we need to focus on those that are really small and, 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 and really need this kind of solution. So, uh, and that's part of our uh, main focus. If we see uh, what are the challenges that uh, uh, the agriculture sector faces at a crossroads in Latin America, uh, obviously this is a fundamental sector. We are an ex, I mean, we are the region which is the net exporter of, of ag goods. So this sector is really important in terms of output, employment and growth. Uh, the region is in a uniquely positioned in a competitive global environment. Reforcing of, of regional alliances with impact in value chain sourcing. We also are uniquely impacted by climate check. A shift in consumer demand, preference will likely reshape to, uh, the sector. And technological change is accelerating and we have seen it especially after this uh, COVID uh, uh, crisis. Uh, and they're still uh, related, as, as um, my colleagues in the in the panel mentioned, there's still challenges related to finance adoption uh, of technology and value chains. Uh, we have seen these 11 type of innovations uh, currently transforming the region in, in, in luck, but if we, and, and an increasing number of Actec startups coming from the region, if we, we have been really looking forward it, I mean, we're, we have really been mapping, but if you, we obviously compare these to FinTech or other sectors, we are really far away. I mean, we, we can say that the ag tech sector is, is flourishing, but still far away from, 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 from the FinTech or, or, or similar uh, uh, sectors. And, and now, I mean, if you see education and, and the effect of uh, COVID, that's another sector that has increased a lot. Um, related to, to Brian presentations, where we see um, 
a high concentration of, 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 of innovations is probably in, in those related to data, artificial intelligence, intelligence and digital services. Um, when we talk about digital services, I think this is very important because there's a, a, an increased number of uh, trading platforms, outsourcing and financing, and also farm management and information and education services. And we see, uh, I mean, even though this is the, the largest number uh, of uh, big data and precision agriculture, they are not uh, obviously the, the, I mean, if, if we sum them all, we still have a uh, room there to, to improve and, uh, and increase. Uh, uh, the other thing that uh, most of the innovation we are seeing in the region are in farm innovations and not uh, so many in the, in the, in the value chain. Uh, also, most of the solutions we have seen here, they have like a broad uh, farming, like they can be used in different situations, but we think that a uh, part of, uh, of the evolution of the sector probably will be focusing more on verticals and, and having the, like the right fit with uh, what uh, it's produced in, in, in each country. And also, uh, as you know, we, we have a, a very important role in financing uh, in early stage, and we really believe that uh, venture remains the go-to market for, for innovation finance. Uh, we, ha we have done uh, some uh, uh, investments in, in, in early stage, and we are also, last year, we, 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 we partnered with SP Venture, which is the first Actec fund uh, in a uh, specific for 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 in, in latin america so we are we, we we really believe that this is a way to still you know uh, focusing on 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 impact and and trying to 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 reach a uh, uh, solutions that uh, have the right fit uh, to the region so um that's that's all thank you Really, uh, thank you so much for for your engagement and discussion on this. It's 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 really interesting and, and inspiring even to see that we seem to be converging around, you know, kind of key cross cutting issues that that we actually could organize around and 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 find some ways to solve together. Um, you know, so the 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 data question, um, you know. It appears that certainly there's a data demand and a data gap and a need for responsible data kind of intermediation and sharing. And um, I don't quite see it happening in the agricultural space as, as much as we see it. I think the most inspiring and interesting models probably are coming from the public health space where you need to have, you know, you, know, you need to know that there is a real person behind a data set, but you don't need to know who they are. In the same way, we need to know that there's a real farm behind a data set, but we don't need to know the latitude and longitude, or certainly not the farmer's name or, or, or what have you. And so, um, you know, and I think that that also is, it's both a symptom and a contributor probably to the fragmentation that, um, that uh, in some way all of us have been talking about, you know, about how um, you know, this, this, this innovation space, this digital innovation space is, seems to be hindered a little bit because there's a lot of duplication of efforts and there's also a kind of data, you know, kind of balkanization or fragmentation of the data. Um, I just, I guess we should, we really only have time for one cross-cutting question before I think we'll be able to wrap up unless our moderators give us a little bit more, a little bit, a bit more line. Um, but where do you see sort of the greatest opportunities for overcoming fragmentation, where we're talking about aligning interests, where do you at least see the most aligned interests where we should be able to do something um, to really move this kind of digital agriculture discipline forward um, from your regional and, and institutional perspectives? From our perspective, the first and most, it might be difficult, but the first most things that we would like to do happen is that the link 
um, smallholder farmers with the, the market, and that's the area where we would like to start with. I think Sarah mentioned something on this one. Without access to the commercial opportunities directly, farmer will not invest in all this, any of the aggregators along the value chain will not mm -hmm. make any investment into any of this efficiency gain investment for the, for the technology. So first instance, what we usually do is the, um, even without any technology solution, we go into the farmer and say, hey, do you wanna go you know, try out the next new marketing, marketing opportunities? And that could come from the platforms or the link. If you register your groups or that yourself as a part of this as a supplier, you that's your you know new business opportunities, mm -hmm. and you can make money out of this. And with the profit, the use of the profit can go into the other sort of the like utilization of the platform services again for the uh, best advices that they can get based on which they procure the best quality food, uh, the, the seeds or inputs and what, whatever. That's a sort of like a entry point for most of our cases. And um, to be frank with you, there's no one platform that is gonna be <laughs> bundled them all. In fact, and it's gonna be, that's, that's gonna be the idea platform. If you can come up with that, that's gonna be great. <laughs> but uh, um, we are just uh, muddling through that. But I said, that's the area we would like to collaborate, particularly with all the other institution that has got the same goal as mm -hmm. uh, objective. Um, if I can um, compliment Michigo, uh, I, I really, believe that what she's telling is, is something true. I mean, you have to create the right incentives for small holders. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, of, of the case of uh, Stellabs. I think uh, most of us know that case in India related to, to dairy uh, farmers. And, and, and it's incredible because some of them only have four cows right which is really uh, as very small and what they really achieve and I, I think that's a, a case of success is that what they they, they started uh, giving the opportunity uh, for 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 dairy farmers to have like traceability for for their milk and from there there's a lot of new services including a uh, uh, fintech services and, and financial services which is still struggling and it's still an issue and a relevant issue in in our in our region that we're offered so uh, i think michigo was really uh, i mean I, I think that's the concept and that's the kind of of, of of solutions that we really need to to be working another thing that uh, Brian really concerns us is uh, the lack of linkage between research and the and the solutions uh, that are in 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 market. We think, uh, uh, at least in Latin America and in many other uh, countries, uh, agriculture research uh, is really. I mean, there, there's investment both from the public and private side, but we don't see that those kind of research really, uh, I mean, uh, transform into, into solutions that are uh, going into market and are, not, and are uh, I mean, user-friendly for, for farmers. Uh, uh, so we see there that there's also a, a large, uh, 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 I mean, I think there, 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 is, there is a really very important and relevant field for, for, for for future collaboration between entrepreneurs and the R and D system. Yes. No. Thank you. I, I you know, I, I fully recognize and acknowledge uh, Anna's uh, just contributions and what Miko said. So I want to just add to um, to what we see as a potential interface. Uh, I think maybe deepening, first of all, research interface with the private sector, we find that the, the slide that really spoke to me was when you mentioned the research cycle. And that usually then should culminate into an investment decision that would then result in the private sector looking at an idea and the appraisal and the pre-feasibility and all that. And I really feel at the moment it's delinked. 
So how can CJR really sort of approach the private sector and have some sort of link between the R&D cycle and the investment cycle and really take that opportunity to market? So it's different ways of doing business, but I don't know whether you need to take some of the business people into CJR and take CJR into the business people and then yeah. think up with some form of, um, of, of a co interface and connection there. So that is uh, one area that could be of, uh, you know, something you want to really look in, even as the CGR rolls out its uh, digital uh, digitization. And then it's the public sector interface as well. I really feel there is an analytical gap, uh, a very deep one, particularly from where I sit from. Yes, there is fragmented research that isn't really, there's no data sets being imposed on each other that can actually bring about a co comprehensive and coherent uh, narrative around transition pathways for rural transformation. So we do data collection, there is some solutions for GPIS type mapping, but it's all a bit fragmented and it needs to come underneath one house. We do see these national agriculture investment programs this is something that's championed also by the African Union, by the Regional Economic Commissions. Um, but somehow then there's a missing link uh, in, in getting those, those different data sets to make sense and to speak sense to the policy making processes. So if, if CJR can come in very strongly there, we would see quite a lot of value um, uh, being added to, uh, to, to that space. And, and then um, the, the other part of it, I think it comes back to climate. We, we see really changing landscapes and we think CJR can really play a role in the, the data set around it. And in two, one is the agenda for rejuvenation and rebuilding, laying down new standards for conservation of natural resources, which have already been degraded. Uh, I think you are uniquely placed as CJR to be able to come in, crowd in series of technologies and efforts to rejuvenate places that have already uh, gone down. And then the other one is actually promote and make transparent the degradation that is taking place so that we can actually build in the incentives that would encourage smallholder farmers to continue uh, to use those systems, not only in a responsible way, um, but, you know, cognizant of what is actually happening around them. Sometimes we send messages to urban zones, but we also don't send messages to the rural zones. So this this interface, I think, is uniquely a uh, place for yourselves. So over to you, uh, Brian. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Those are those are really great, really great comments. I think um, there's some there's some interesting co correspondences here, particularly when we look at this digital services question. I mean, we are there's this universal agreement, certainly on this call, and I think probably much more broadly that there's this huge untapped opportunity. And in fact, even um, some recent research that quantified the untapped opportunity in terms of being able to reach small businesses, farmers at scale. Um, there's also a recognition that purely commercial financing um, is is really difficult for these large, you know, being able to reach, you know, smallholder farmers at scale, and uh, it really difficult, if not impossible. And so, um, there seems to be a really natural entry point where we can start to mitigate some of the risks of those digital services. We can start to create some of the data and analytic assets that can support those services. And I don't think it's you know the strong point of CJR to get involved in product development and so forth. But we can we can engage as researchers on the validation. We can engage as researchers on the you know the envirotyping and climatic um, and kind of adaptation and mitigation options that make sense. Um, and perhaps we can also help you know as you know jointly as public interest actors in kind of creating the data and you know assets and, and analytics that then. Um, you know, others can go forth and actually put them into practice across, be they, you know, private sector digital services or public sector interventions from policy um, or what have you. I, I wholeheartedly agree that we need tighter linkages um, between research and, and, um, and private sector broadly, but also uh, digital services in particular in the context of this, this strategy. And I think it kind of works in both directions. Um, on one hand, um, you know, we aspire to be data-driven 
um, and doing research that 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 serves development um, objectives um, on the CGIR side. And so, and on the other hand, the ability to provide some validation and engagement um, generation of evidence about what's working um, on this on the you know in the digital services side, I think would be a great um, a great service to uh, say startups, you know who. Um, are generally config generally configured towards getting a great product done, but not necessarily geared towards capturing evidence about the product. And so um, I see some really natural complementarities, and I think that um, you know we're I'm actually inspired that we've got real common view about where the gaps are that need to bridge, because I think it opens up some really great opportunities for for more collective action and more targeted collective action. So I'm going to have to stop here. I'm really sorry that I have to. I think that um, we're well. We're going to be we're going to be online together, uh, and um, and we'll be we'll be live and we'll have chats. And so I hope we can continue this discussion about how do we build the collective actions that are kind of digitally enabled um, across these various dimensions, and in fact across all of these regions that are represented um, here in this in this meeting. Mm -hmm.